Good evening, everyone. We have a great presentation in store for you tonight, our very own worship brother, Dan Kimball. So thank you again for taking some time out of your evening to join us for Masonic Education. This episode marks our 23rd education in the series entitled 21st Century Conversations on Freemasonry. And this is the 42nd virtual education since we started in 2020. And I believe we've been consecutive each month. I don't believe we've missed a month. Um, for Masons to fully comprehend and understand the magnificence of Freemasonry, we must always remember to remain a student of our tools and our tenants with honor and respect. So may tonight be another lesson that will allow us to continue to better understand ourselves and to ultimately achieve further light in Masonry. For those of you who are returning visitors to our education, thank you for coming back. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. We thank you for being with us. First, I would like to go through and recognize the Masonic sponsors and participating brothers who helped make these presentations possible. Of course, I want to thank the Rubicon Masonic Society. I would like to thank the William O'Ware Lodge of Research. I would like to thank Lexington Lodge Number 1. And the brothers who are assisting with that know who they are, and I appreciate your assistance very much. Worship Brother Tom Nitschke, will you please do the honors, sir, and deliver the opening devotion? Brethren, if you'll join me. Good, great architect of the universe, as we gather together today for this meeting, may we be guided in all, all that we say or do by a strong sense of your presence with us. Grant us our, for, for our labors the wages proper for us, the corn of nourishment, the wine of refreshment, and the oil of joy. May our meeting together on this day be such that nourishes and sustains us in the work which is ours as Masons. May the friendship we share as brethren give refreshment to our spirits. May the proceedings in which we are engaged and the friends we greet today give us joy that encourages us, revitalizes us, and adds deep meaning to our lives together. Amen. So moved. Well said, brother. Thank you very much. Brothers, as you know, the Rubicon Masonic Society is a special group, and it's a group that is brought together Masons to assist in the improvements of oneself by establishing a deeper understanding of Freemasonry, its traditions and practices, and further cementing the brotherhood of the fraternity for the betterment of mankind. Any opinions expressed during this virtual education will be those of the presenter or the participant. They do not necessarily reflect the views of any lodge or grand lodge or the Rubicon Masonic Society. By participating with us, you do consent to our guidelines and our full disclaimer can be found at Rubicon Masonic Society slash disclaimer. Brothers and friends, as you know, these are not tiled meetings. Masons and non-Masons are more than welcome to attend and are encouraged to participate. So please be mindful that anything discussed this evening should be suitable for Masons of all degrees as well as non-Masons. Gentlemanly manners are to be expected at all times. No alcohol, no smoking, no food or foul language during the presentations. There will also be no discussion of politics or religion at any time. Some quick recommendations. Recommended attire for each meeting is coat and tie. Please type your name and any appropriate Masonic title or location under your video. If you're not a Mason, please simply type guest after your name. Please enable your video camera so all attendees can see you. Please reduce background noise, turn off all computer programs to eliminate outside distractions. And of course, please be patient should any technical difficulties occur. Brothers and friends, tonight's guest presenter is Worship Brother Dan Kimball, and he will be presenting on the topic, Voices of Freemasonry. Worship Brother Bizak, will you please do the honors of introducing our very special friend and guest? Yes, thank you, brother. Dan Kimball is a fifth generation Freemason and a fourth generation member of Hayes Lodge 517 and Good Faith Lodge 95. He's a native of Smith Grove, Kentucky, and a graduate of Western Kentucky University and Salmon P. Chase College of Law. And he resides in Covington with his wife, Holly. He's a past master of William O'Ware Lodge of Research in Newport, or at the Newport Lodge as well, 358 Elvin Helms Lodge, 926, and Alba Lodge, 222 in Washington, D.C. He served the Grand Lodge as a member of the Committee on Masonic Education, Committee on Bylaws, District Deputy Grand Master for District 18, as a parliamentarian and Grand Persuaven. And Brother Kimball's also a member of the Scottish Rite, Valley of Covington, Society of Past Masters of North Kentucky, Northern Kentucky, 
And reflecting his interest in Masonic research, he's also a member of Indiana's Dwight Smith Lodge of Research, the Masonic Society, the Philolathe Society, and the Scottish Rite Research Society. Dan is a member and recorder for the Rubicon Masonic Society, and he serves on Rubicon's uh, Discovering Freemasonry Virtual Education Committee. He's also a co-producer of the popular documentary, The Masonic Table, and co-editor of the upcoming Masonic uh, trans or the Transactions of Rubicon Masonic Society, Volume 1. He's a member of the research committee at William O. Ware Lodge of Research, and he initiated the survey project, The Voice of Freemasonry, in 2019. And tonight, his presentation is going to reveal for discussion certain themes that have occurred throughout the course of that important project. So, Brother Dan, the floor is yours. Good evening, brothers. Worshipful Brother John and, and Worshipful Brother Brian, thank you for that kind introduction. I will point out, uh, just uh, for the record, I'm a member of Alba Lodge uh, 222 in Washington, D.C., but not a past master there. So I, I want to make sure that, uh, that no one thinks I'm a past master of that lodge, but I'm happy, very happy to be a member of it. Uh, so tonight's presentation is, in fact, um, about the voices of Freemasonry, and, uh, and uh, Worshipful Brother Brian is going to assist me with the uh, slides. So um, I think we should have a, a first slide, Brian, that comes up that says, who speaks for Freemasonry? Uh, so let me know if, um, there we go, who speaks for Freemasonry? Um, so while we are looking at, uh, at that particular slide, let me begin by uh, making it very clear that uh, that I do not speak for Freemasonry. Um, and I think this is a pretty good place to uh, to give my own personal disclaimer as well. Um, I don't speak for any particular lodge uh, or any uh, group of Masons, certainly not the Rubicon Masonic Society. And I think by the time this presentation is over with, you will um, certainly be aware of the fact that I don't speak for any Grand Lodge. Um, but who does then, in fact, speak, speak for Freemasonry? Well, you could make the argument that masters speak on behalf of their lodges, but masters generally only serve a one-year term. So that means the voice of Freemasonry for that particular lodge would change every year. Well, what about grandmasters? Grandmasters, again, generally only serve for one-year term. So does the voice of Freemasonry change every year? Um, I think the answer to the question is no one speaks for Freemasonry. Freemasonry speaks for itself, but all Masons have a voice. Now, how does Freemasonry speak for itself? In the Entered Apprentice degree, uh, we remind each other in our opening and closing ceremonies why it is that we have come together. We've come together to learn. We've come together to improve ourselves. We've come together to learn to practice self-discipline. As we lead a candidate through the initiation process of the Entered Apprentice degree, we tell that candidate that the purpose of Freemasonry is to make its votaries wiser, better, and consequently happier. And I think that's an example, not the only example by any stretch of the imagination, but that's an example of how Freemasonry speaks for itself, and it does so through its ritual. Well, why then are we interested in voices of Freemasonry? Because while Freemasonry speaks for itself, all Masons have a voice. And in 2019, William O'Ware Lodge of Research began this particular process of uh, collecting uh, the ideas and opinions of Freemasons who wanted to comment on particular issues relevant to Freemasonry. The Lodge of Research had a desire to capture the ideas of Freemasons with respect to Freemasonry. Or to put it maybe a little more simply, we wanted to hear what Masons were saying when they talked about Freemasonry. We also wanted to offer a forum wherein men could express their thoughts about Freemasonry. So there have been five editions of the Voices of Freemasonry to date. 132 men have expressed their views about <clears throat> issues in contemporary Freemasonry. And if you're interested in looking at those, uh, you can find them on our website at uh, WilliamOwareLodgeOfResearch.com. There are many men who have uh, joined us here this evening 
who uh, have already participated in this particular process. And you may see some of your ideas being displayed tonight. And we'll talk about some of those things. Worship Brother Kimball, now, with my uh, rude interruption, I'm having a difficult time uh, keeping up with the slide that you want to show on the screen with your presentation. Could you um, give me some You're time? You're perfect so far, uh, but, but, but we can go to the next one. I'll cue you that way. How's that? There we go, about the questionnaires. So as I mentioned, we've done this five times and we have a sixth edition in the works right now. Questions one, two, and 10, and, and these are 10 question questionnaires. So questions one, two, and 10 are roughly the same on each set and those sort of set our baseline of the issues that we wanna capture. The remaining questions vary with each edition, loosely generated around a central theme. The 132 responses represent a 21.8% rate of return on the questionnaires sent to Freemasons. So it's roughly one fifth. So to get 132 responses, I had to send out roughly 600 different questionnaires to get 132 back. That's a, a rate of response that's relatively consistent with other surveys that William O'Ware Lodge of Research has undertaken. In 2019, in 2020, uh, we worked on a, a, a survey called Characteristics of an Ideal Lodge, and that was exclusively for Kentucky Masons. We ended up getting 476 responses back from that, but we had to send out about 2,000 uh, pieces of mail to, uh, to get the 400 responses. Again, roughly a 20% rate of return. In um, 2020, perhaps, or maybe 2021, I can't remember the exact year, there was a uh, committee formed by the Grand Lodge of Kentucky to uh, uh, research the um, viability of um, not just using the Not Just a Man and Mason marketing campaign. And if you're familiar with that, it's a, uh, a series of advertisements on social media about Freemasonry that was um, produced by the uh, Northern Jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite. There was an electronic survey that was sent out to Kentucky Masons. About 9,000 Kentucky Masons received it and about 900 responded. So that's a 10% rate of return. One of the things that, that uh, we have found over the years is that the rate of return is a story all unto itself. And uh, we can uh, talk about different reasons why uh, Freemasons don't participate in surveys about Freemasonry. And I think uh, just to very men quickly mention some of those things, there is a there's a small cohort of men, I think, who are hostile to the idea of, uh, of doing research about Freemasonry in general and, uh, and just don't like the idea that um, that we're collecting data. Um, there's a fear of retaliation in many instances in the um, uh, early uh, part of collecting uh, voices of Freemasonry questionnaires. Uh, we had one fellow who uh, who uh, sent in a questionnaire, was pretty candid in his remarks, and then called me about a week later and said, uh, please don't post that, uh, because he was afraid of retaliation because of his remarks. Um, I have had a couple of individuals who have called me, and, and this shocked me, quite frankly, but a couple of individuals who called me and, uh, and said that they would really like to help me and like to uh, participate in the, uh, in, the, in the questionnaire and in the survey, but they didn't understand, um, they just didn't understand it. Uh, and, and they didn't, they frankly didn't possess the ability to complete the questionnaire. And, uh, and that was a, a pretty um, illuminating moment, I think for me that we had people who just didn't have the ability to read the questionnaire and determine what it meant. But I think the primary reason, and there's no way to measure this, so we, we are into the realm of opinion at this particular point. I think the primary reason is that Masons generally just aren't that interested in Freemasonry. And when they get a questionnaire, either electronically or in the mail, the easiest way to deal with it is to ignore it or throw it away. And I think that's one of the things that we encounter in dealing with our fraternity. And one of the things that we who are here this evening probably meet uh, every time we walk into a Masonic Lodge, and that is the level of disinterest among Freemasons towards Masonry. All right, Brian, let's look at the next slide. So the first 
question on the on every questionnaire is what influenced you to seek membership in Freemasonry. And if you look at the responses there, there probably aren't any surprises. Uh, family and friends comprise 99 out of the 132 uh, men who, who responded to that. Now, if you add these up, you're going to get more than 132 because some people listed more than one factor in, the, in what influenced them to become Freemasons. But generally, it's all about family and friends. So to put it in a slightly different context, why do men become Freemasons? And the answer is because of us, because of what they see us do. I've been reading recently the works of Joseph Fort Newton. And this, uh, there's a quote in one of uh, Newton's books. It's called The Men's House, uh, published, I think, in 1923. It's a series of articles that Newton wrote. But in one of his essays, he wrote these words. What's brought about this feeling? and attractiveness towards Freemasonry. It's due to the quiet dignity of the men of the order and the noble way that they've shown its influence in their lives. Brothers, we're a walking billboard for Freemasonry. And I, I think that's something that we need to bear in mind. What attracts men to Freemasonry? We do. Uh, and you can see that there are some other uh, issues that, uh, that have brought men in, some seeking fraternity, uh, some men admitted to a curiosity, uh, D. Malay has certainly been a, a factor and an influence. And then there were some other issues, and I've listed those below, charity, self-improvement, history, esoterics, the principles. Um, I had one fellow told me that he uh, became a Freemason so that he could join his wife's Eastern Star chapter. And that may be the only time that I've received a, an answer like that. But we're the, we're the reason that people come to Freemasonry. It's what they see in us and why they want to be a part of the fraternity. All right, Brian, let's go to the next slide. This next question is also in some form found on each of the questionnaires. How would you assess the current state of Freemasonry? As you can see, 58 said it's in decline or danger. That's 44% of the responses. That's a pretty significant plurality. And other men said we're evolving, it's hopeful, 11 think it's just fine, and 6 said outright it's dying. So let's look at those who think that we're in decline or in danger. And that's the next slide, Brian. <clears throat> of the men who think that we are in decline or in some level of danger, the most common response that we received was Masonry is out of touch. Freemasonry is out of touch with contemporary society. There were several uh, men who indicated that we are lacking upstanding men. And I read that in two or three different ways and none of them uh, none of them are very good. But if you go back to what Newton wrote, Joseph Fort Newton, that quote that I gave you just a moment ago, if we are the reason that people become Freemasons, if it's our influence and our example, if that's a true statement and Freemasonry is lacking upstanding men, then it tells me that as a rule, as a whole, we don't do a very good job representing our fraternity. Uh, some have said we're in turmoil, some say we're dim but alive, and then we had a couple of guys who used exactly the same uh, analogy, and that is we are like an ostrich with our head in the sand, ignoring the reality of what goes on around us. Now, how about the positives of the men who are hopeful on the next slide? We see shrinking but viable, stabilizing, and then another common response was masonry is in a renaissance. And I think because of assemblies like this, we can argue to some extent that there is a renaissance going on within Freemasonry. How far that renaissance will go remains to be seen. All right, on to some specific questions. And you're gonna see as we go through this, some of the questions are gonna be very specific, some are more general. Now, this is a question that's near and dear to us in Kentucky. Kentucky is one of the minority jurisdictions that mandates that all of its lodge business be done on the Master Mason degree. There have been some attempts in recent years to allow lodges to do business on the degree of their choice. In Kentucky, that has not succeeded. Although the majority of jurisdictions now in the United States do allow lodges to conduct business on the degree of choice. So <clears throat> that, um, that particular question appeared in volume four of Voices of Freemasonry. 
And of the respondents to that, 19 men said, yes, allow uh, the lodge to do business on any degree. And seven said, no. All right, Brian, you can go on to the next slide. So let's look at some specific responses to that. Tim Avon from Kentucky said, lodges wouldn't feel the necessity of rushing men through so they can sit in on the business meetings. And I think that particular response has a couple of other issues contained within it. And that is the way we rush men through the, um, the degrees so that they become master masons in roughly 60 days. And one of the um, um, responses in Kentucky that we have heard to the idea of allowing um, lodges to conduct business on lower degrees is that there's really no reason for that type of legislation because they're going to be master masons in 60 days and they'll be able to sit and lodge anyway. But that presumes that we're going to put them through uh, 30 days, 30 days. The um, phenomenon of allowing lodges to conduct business on lower degrees allows men to participate in the business life of the lodge, but without the necessity of being um, uh, funneled through in, in, in such short order. So one of the things that we are addressing at the same time that we address the issue of whether or not to allow business on a lesser degree, the underlying issue is, are we putting men through the degrees too quickly and not taking the time to ground them in each degree? In other words, do we need to slow down? David Felty of Florida says there's a big risk in allowing entered apprentices and fellow crafts to attend business meetings. They might drop out before becoming master masons if they find out as entered apprentices and fellow crafts just how boring Masonic business can be. And I think what Brother Felty points out in this particular answer is um, opening on a lesser degree and conducting your business on a lesser degree isn't a magic bullet. A dead lodge is a dead lodge. It doesn't matter what degree you open on or what degree you do your business on question is what's going on in your lodge. And again, we'll go back to Brother Avon. Are you grounding men in the uh, principles and lessons of Freemasonry? Moving on to the next question. This one also appeared in um, volume five. Do you think that dual or plural memberships in lodges within the same Grand Lodge jurisdiction are a good idea? Uh, the respondents, 21 said yes, two said no, and six weren't sure. Uh, so of those, uh, of those responses, let's look at some specifics. Let's go to the next slide, Brian. Carl Hoy of Wisconsin said dual or plural memberships allow members to develop ties to their local lodges and their communities while maintaining their connection to their home lodge. Glenn Parker of Missouri, it's good for lodges that lack members. And that is by far the most common response that we receive for this particular question. It allows lodges with fewer members an opportunity to get members from outside. It, it, it props up that particular lodge. And that's exactly the issue that Tony Skeens uh, of Paintsville Lodge in Kentucky says, it has the effect of spreading the same faces throughout many lodges to keep dying lodges alive, which is a bad thing in my opinion. And I think that's one of the issues that we have to address when we think about plural memberships is, we're effectively propping up lodges that would otherwise die. Now, go back to Brother Hoy's comment, dual or plural memberships allow members to develop ties to their local lodges while maintaining their connection to their home lodge. And that's certainly a legitimate concern, no question about that. If your home lodge is 200 miles away and you wanna maintain your membership there and affiliate with a lodge closer to home, shouldn't be objectionable in any sense. But I think we do have to ask the question that if we're allowing dual memberships only for the purpose, of propping up a lodge that really can't maintain its uh, its viability otherwise, or if we're doing it so that the Grand Lodge can collect extra assessments, are we doing ourselves any favor? And that's sort of the issue that we're dealing with here. On to the next question, and again, uh, from volume five. Do you believe that membership in one of the appendant bodies like the Scottish Rite or the York Rite enhances the overall experience in Freemasonry? 25 men said yes, four no, and five weren't sure. So let's go to some specific responses about that. <coughs> Tim Laramore of Ohio 
says the Masonic education one receives in the three Blue Lodge degrees is just the beginning. Joining one or more of the appended bodies will build and strengthen a brother's understanding of what our fraternity is all about. And Brother Laramore's answer is representative of most of the people who said the appendant bodies, membership in the appendant bodies is a good idea. There is the notion that uh, membership in the appendant body will enhance one's understanding of Freemasonry. Michael Vickery, though, of Georgia says, if the making of a Mason is realized in the Blue Lodge, I've discovered that the appendant bodies are a low value added proposition. They now become competitors for a Mason's most scarce resource is time. And I think that's a point well made and one that we need to think about quite a bit. All Masons have a finite amount of time. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to do all the things that we would like to do. And we find that as membership dwindles because of the bodies that are necessary to maintain the operations of these various organizations, the appendant bodies and the blue lodges are competing for the individual Masons time. And as membership continues to dwindle, that's going to be an issue with which we have to uh, confront, uh, I, I think, far more um, aggressively than we have done to this point. Moving on. By the way, uh, the answers that I have uh, selected to um, present this evening, uh, these don't represent uh, the greatest hits or the best of. These are just answers that resonated with me. And if you want to read other answers and other opinions, then please go to the website, look at all the responses to this, find the ones that, that resonate with you. But all I've done is select some that, that I found to be uh, particularly um, insightful with respect to the question that was asked. This particular question goes back to volume one. How would you assess the current state of Freemasonry? And uh, Michael Stoops of Kansas, the past grand master there, I thought gave a very thoughtful answer. Freemasonry is split into at least two major factions. The majority of Masons believe that Masonry is just a civic organization, a social charity, or a fellowship club. There's a much smaller but growing group that truly understand that Masonry is much more than those things. I think that's well said by most worshipful brother Stoops. Uh, if we move on to the uh, next question, this is again from volume one. What do you see? In contemporary Freemasonry that makes you optimistic about its future, Chad Lasick of Illinois gave a very thoughtful answer, and I'm going to skip down to his second sentence. Smaller Freemasonry is better Freemasonry, since the only people that will be practicing it will be the ones most dedicated to it. I would rather have 30 great Masons who live Freemasonry in their daily lives than a thousand men whose only connection to the craft is a dues card in their wallet. For many years, uh, we have talked about strength in fewness, and Worshipful Brother Bizak has written extensively about that concept in strength of strength in fewness, and I think this answer captures that as well, that as we grow smaller, uh, we have an opportunity to actually uh, become stronger, and, uh, and that's something that uh, I think, again, as time passes, we'll see uh, the direction that, that that particular phenomenon takes. All right, um, again, from volume one, if tasked with the project of improving the current state of Freemasonry, where would you begin? John Cameron of Nova Scotia said, I would start by assigning qualified mentors to the younger members, not only for their journey of initiating, passing and raising, but for a period of time until they're able to assume that role. So uh, Brother Cameron talks about mentorship. And um, uh, that's an important uh, aspect of Freemasonry that unfortunately is overlooked. And I think also that particular answer and the issue of mentorship also goes back and addresses the issue of how quickly are we moving men through the degrees? Is this an opportunity to talk about as we mentor men to slow this process down to make sure that they are grounded in Freemasonry? And, and brothers, it doesn't matter to me if men move through Freemasonry in 60 days or 90 days or 365 days. The issue is whether or not we're grounding them. The time is immaterial. We need to be sure that men are being grounded in the lessons, the philosophy and history of Freemasonry before they're being advanced. Okay, um, now we move to volume two, and that is, um, what would you like to see your lodge offer that it currently does not? 
that would enhance your Masonic experience. Brendan Mills of Kentucky says Masonic education needs to be the number one priority in lodges, but it needs to be deep, deeper knowledge than what the degree work teaches us on face value. The rich lessons of the fraternity are hidden in allegory and rightfully so, but those allegories are not really explored well to help members extract their benefit. One of the very common um, responses that I hear when I talk to Masons in various lodges about what it is that they're teaching their new members is that we teach them the ritual and we bring them back into lodge after their degree and we walk them through the same ceremony and we repeat the same words, but we're not educating our brethren beyond the ritual. And I think that's what Brother Mills is asking for here. And it's what he's saying should be a priority in our lodges. And that is an exploration of what the ritual means. What do the words actually mean? What's the 21st century definition of some of these words and how do they apply to us? I think we have missed in general the practical application of the lessons of Freemasonry to contemporary society. And that again might go back to the answers about the lack of upstanding men and to Joseph Fort Newton's comments about how we are the advertisements for Freemasonry. Of the things that men said that they would like to see and lodge, but they aren't seeing right now, the top of the list was music, and I was kind of surprised by that. But, but many men on this particular question said they wanted to see music incorporated into the lodge. A substantial number said they would like to see meditation. More said Masonic dining, and some said the incorporation of technology. A few weeks ago, not a few weeks ago, a few months ago, we had a wonderful presentation here on um, uh, on this series uh, by uh, Brother Steve Peterson of, uh, of Lexington Lodge about music. And I would encourage um, anybody to go back and take a look at Brother Peterson's presentation and look at ways to incorporate music into your, um, into your lodge experience. Moving on, in what ways has Freemasonry been useful to you in your quest for personal improvement? Uh, Chuck Dunning, a noted uh, Masonic author and lecturer from Texas, says countless ways. The teachings of Freemasonry are interwoven with every aspect of my personal existence. Masonry has provided a rich fabric of symbolism, ritual, and fellowship, in which I have grown and continue to grow my understanding and expression of virtue, philosophy, spirituality, and love. It's led me to continue to outgrow older, less lightened conceptual, conceptualizations of the world, human nature, the divine, and myself. It's facilitated numerous new questions, epiphanies, awakenings, and other transformative experiences. If there is a, a one paragraph um, uh, definition of what Freemasonry can do in a man's life, I would challenge you to find a better one than that. It's easy to see why Brother Dunning is, uh, is the noted author that he is. Uh, that's a great answer. Uh, Kevin Sullivan, from St. Andrew's Lodge in Kentucky, uh, gave an answer that I find uh, a particularly uh, one that I can relate to quite well. And that is, it's given me the opportunity to meet and talk to numerous people with whom I otherwise wouldn't have had the occasion to spend time. There are a great number of really good guys that I have only met because of the fraternal tie. And isn't that exactly a restatement of what our ritual says when we talk about the fact that Freemasonry brings together men who otherwise would have remained at a perpetual distance. I think that's a great restatement of that. In what ways has Freemasonry been useful to you in your quest for personal improvement? Eric Marks from Massachusetts wrote, the process of Freemasonry is sublime. The ideals allowed me to use it as a container for my self-exploration and self-examination I recognize I can still use my lodge to test my resolve, to try to chip off the rough bits of my personality, to question my lack of charitable thought and action toward my brothers and humanity as a whole. It had been my hope that this was the reason that men joined Masonry. It's a very thoughtful answer. And I, I, I very much uh, enjoyed reading uh, this brother's um, uh, remarks on his questionnaire. Philip Blair from Kentucky says, if I'm candid, Freemasonry has not taught me any principles or virtues that I did not already know. Freemasonry has provided me an opportunity to explore those principles and virtues in ways that I did not realize. Now, several years ago, uh, Worshipful Brother Bizak published a book called Notable Men in Kentucky, Free in Kentucky History Who Happened to be Freemasons. 
And as he was uh, preparing that book, I had a few conversations with him about that. And we were talking about how men of leadership classes in previous centuries seemed to be more drawn to Freemasonry than those of contemporary society. And one of the things that we talked about was that it's unlikely that any of those men came to Freemasonry to learn principles and virtues. But Freemasonry affirmed the principles and virtues, the values that they already had. And that's one of the things that made Freemasonry attractive to them. It was a place that affirmed their beliefs at that particular time. And I think that's a pretty thoughtful response from Brother Blair. And I think he's essentially saying the same thing, that Freemasonry affirmed the values that he already possessed. All right, one of my favorites, this comes from volume four. Do you view Freemasonry as being a primarily charitable organization? Uh, Brother Michelle Brassard from Ontario says, we are benevolent. It's one of the qualities that we exhibit. However, I would venture to say benevolence is often thought of as gift of coin and not so much as benevolence of spirit of friendship to the world at large. My benevolence is personal. It's often a handshake, a telephone call, a smile and kind words, and also a coin. And that's well said too, Brother Broussard. Uh, it's, that's an aspect of charity that we overlook. And it's the charity of spirit, much more so than charity of financial assistance. Randy Sanders of Missouri says, charity is a natural outreach from being a better man. And so it is. But charity for charity's sake is a mental trap in gaining endorphins. And I think what uh, Brother Sanders is getting at is that uh, giving away money sometimes is a cheap feel-good process. It's much more effective to have charity of spirit. That's my opinion. Uh, moving on. Why, in your opinion, do men continue to pay dues to a lodge but never attend any of the meetings or events? Dave Hosler of Indiana says, I believe those men were sold something in their journey from an errand apprentice to a master mason and the lodge sadly didn't deliver on those promises in the degrees. Brandon Lewis from Prince Hall Lodge number one in Tennessee uh, gave several answers. He says they're at different stages of life. They weren't assigned to do anything after having been raised. No one kept them engaged within the first six to 12 months and they weren't asked properly in the beginning what they expected from the lodge. Maybe what that Mason wanted was the Lions Club or the Rotary. And I think that's a great response. We don't generally do a very good job of establishing what our expectations are. We don't tell our candidates what it is that they expect, that we expect from them, nor do we tell them what they can expect from us. And I think in the investigation process, it's very important to establish expectations going in. All right, my favorite set of questions coming up. What books written in or before the year 2000 have influenced your Masonic journey? W.L. Wilmshurst, The Meaning of Masonry, uh, had far more uh, responses than anything else. So Wilmshurst, The Meaning of Masonry, was the top book published before 2000 that men said influenced their journey. The other uh, books are uh, Dwight Smith's Whither Are We Traveling, uh, Alan Roberts's uh, The Craft and Its Symbols, H.L. Haywood's The Newly Made Mason, Henry Coyle's um, Comprehensive View of Freemasonry and the little three volume introduction to Freemasonry by Carl Claudy. Uh, I have read all of these except for H.L. Haywood's The Newly Made Mason. And uh, I can tell you that uh, every one of these books is worth your time. If you haven't read it, um, read them, um, I suggest that you do so. And uh, through the good offices of A Books, a copy of the newly made Mason that's on its way to my house. So I, I look forward to reading that one as well. Uh, I particularly, of all of these, I, I particularly like the Carl Claudy set, um, the introduction to Freemasonry. Uh, Carl Claudy, unfortunately, I think is uh, disappearing in terms of being a well-known and well-respected Masonic author. But his work, I think, stands the test of time. And I recommend it highly. All right, Brian, well, now we're ready for books published after the year 2000 that have affected men's Masonic journey. The two most uh, cited are Observing the Craft by Andrew Hammer and Island Freemasonry by our own worshipful brother, Bizak. Um, both of those are excellent books. I recommend them highly. Others that were mentioned are uh, Chris Hodap's Freemasons for Dummies, Brent Morris's 
The Complete Idiot's Guide to Freemasonry, Chuck Dunning's Contemplative Masonry, and Mark Tabert's American Freemasons, Three Centuries of Building Communities. And again, all of those are excellent books, certainly well worth your time. I hope they're in your Masonic library. So our next question was, with which Masonic author of any era would you like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation? The hands-down answer, and this surprised me, fellas, the hands-down answer was Albert Pike. Way more of Albert Pike answers than anyone else. And other responses were Manley Hall, W.L. Wilmshurst, and we had a couple who said James Anderson, and that, that's a great answer, and that surprised me as well. But I love Darren Gullah's response. Darren Gullah uh, from Lexington Lodge One in Kentucky said, Albert Pike, hands down. I really just want to see if he talks the way he writes. Uh, so, uh, so Darren, uh, maybe someday uh, in, in, at Celestial Lodge above, you'll get a chance to, uh, to talk with Brother Pike and see if he really does talk that way. Great answer. Um, the next slide um, is question 10 on all of the questionnaires. What would you say to a man or say to men who are interested in becoming Freemasons. Eric Marks, again, from Massachusetts, gives a great answer. I wouldn't start with saying. I would start with asking and listening. I think that's a great response. What are men looking for? Let's, let's let them talk to us as well as us talking to them. Uh, Lee McConnell from Nova Scotia says there's a difference in joining to become a member and joining to become a Freemason. And that's a distinction that we can't make often enough. There is a difference in being a member and actually being a Mason. The latter is not easy work. It's a lifelong commitment. If you're interested in wanting to improve yourself physically, emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually, you will have mentors and brothers to assist you along the way, but you will have to do the majority of the work yourself because it is each individual's personal journey. Be warned of the solemnity and importance of the step you're about to take. I think most of us have heard that language somewhere along the line. And I couldn't address this question uh, and not uh, include uh, uh, Brother Bizak and, uh, and Brother Brian Evans here as well, because I thought their answers were particularly insightful as well. Brother Bizak said, make an effort to understand the idea of Freemasonry, what it is and what it is not. It's a great answer. And Worshipful Brother Brian said, Freemasonry doesn't offer a prize at the end of the journey. The prize is the journey from the first step until the last step. And Worshipful Brother Brian, that's a great turn of a phrase. There may be a future for you in the science communication. <laughs> Lastly, and this is where I want to end up, and that is um, back again on volume one. What aspect of Freemasonry has most disappointed you? And I, I selected an answer from Worshipful Brother Bill Lorenz. He's a past master of William O'Ware Lodge of Research, a William O'Ware Research Fellow. And it was my good fortune to follow Bill through the chairs at William O'Ware Lodge of Research. And I learned as much watching him and listening to him as I have from any other source in Freemasonry. And I love his answer. He says, I'm not disappointed in Freemasonry. It disappoints me that so many are apathetic. And isn't that really the issue here? Freemasonry is not disappointing. What's disappointing is our response to it. What's wrong with Freemasonry? Absolutely nothing is wrong with Freemasonry. There's a great deal to be said, though, about our response to it. And that's really what this survey is all about. How do we respond to Freemasonry? There is a new uh, edition of Voices of Freemasonry that is uh, coming out now. It's volume six. If you want to participate in that, uh, just send me an email, wkumason at gmail.com. Uh, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to send you a, a copy of, uh, of the latest edition of Voices of Freemasonry. Again, if you want to read what we've already done, it's at uh, William O'Ware, lodgeofresearch.com. If you have participated in one of these before, but you'd like to help us uh, collect uh, responses from other Masons that you know, again, send me an email. I'll send you the link. And if you can help us get, get more men to participate in this, we'd love to collect just as many responses as we possibly can. Brothers, I, I thank you for your kind attention this evening. I hope I haven't bored you too badly. And uh, before I forget, I want to uh, say that I hope that each of you had a very pleasant and happy Thanksgiving. And we won't do this again until after uh, Christmas. So uh, I wish each of you a Merry Christmas as well. 
And uh, with that, Brother Brian, I will turn things back over to you. Worship Brother Dan, thank you. Excellent presentation. Let me get my slides back up. And I appreciate your patience with my uh, struggle with advancing of your slides. Well, when you're dealing with the man with the fewest technological skills on the planet, uh, and I claim that title, uh, I think you did an excellent job. I appreciate that. So the floor is now open for discussion, as it says on the slide here in front of you. Um, and I would like to just maybe start with mentioning a few of my uh, big takeaways. And, and I'd like to see if we can get some responses to this question. Um, I think it was one of the first ones you mentioned. If tasked, if tasked with improving Freemasonry, again, nothing is wrong with Freemasonry, right? But if tasked with, in, with, with improving the experience, how about that, of Freemasonry, where would you begin? And I'd love to get some feedback and some, some answers to that question from anyone that is joining us here tonight. So while we're waiting for some responses, Dan, what is your response to that? Since you've seen all of this information come in, you've seen all the different opinions, good, bad, and, and ugly, so to speak, what are your thoughts? on that question. Come to um, an agreement within your lodge as to what the purpose of your stated meetings are. Um, I, I think there is a, a general default, and that default is the purpose of our meetings is to listen to the minutes being read, pay any bills, and, and plan any activities that might be coming up. And that's kind of what we fall to. But I don't think that's really the purpose of our stated meeting. So why do we meet? Why do we come together on a monthly or bi-monthly basis? What, what do we do that's different and, and should be different than any other place that we can go? The product that we have that no place else has is Freemasonry. So if you want my approach to improving the Masonic experience, focus your stated meeting on Freemasonry. Let's instead of emphasizing the business or the mechanics of the lodge, let's explore the philosophy, the history, the symbolism, the meaning of masonry. You know, some of the older constitutions, um, and I'm talking about constitutions that, that predated Anderson, had provisions in it that um, um, the craft should spend an hour of each meeting talking about masonry. Um, I don't know how realistic an hour is to do that now, although I think if we started doing it, that hour would go by pretty quickly. But we, should, we shouldn't lose fact of the sight that what makes us unique, what we have that nobody else has, is Freemasonry. And because we have that, that should be our focus. That's, that's what we came there to do. So um, uh, that's where I would start, would be refocusing the meeting so that the focus of it becomes an exploration of masonry and not the mechanics. Well said. Well said. I'm going to take it one step further and just expand on what Dan said. I think, I think that is the primary business of the lodge is the exploration of Freemasonry. And if we ask ourselves in the lodge, every time we're doing something, are we exploring Freemasonry by doing this? Now, there's some side angles to that, of course, to certain things we have to do to be able to explore Freemasonry, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what is the primary business coming together in state of communications. And the primary business is the exploration of Freemasonry. Well said. So it's not paying bills and reading minutes. Well, I think we have to do those things so that we can explore it. But uh, when we do it as a primary part of our purpose of meeting, it's hardly exploring Freemasonry. So why, why, in your opinion, John, did the um, administrative side of Freemasonry take so much control over the exploration side of Freemasonry? Uh, I think if we go back and look at uh, factual history, we find that men were not taught or instructed beyond ritual what Freemasonry was, and the natural gravitation was to the mechanics of Freemasonry. It was simpler. 
and we can practice those things that are more convenient, convenient aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And wasn't there something um, uh, in our Grand Lodge Constitution that was changed um, mid 20th century that didn't require education to be a topic of discussion? Am I getting that correct? Yeah. It was a bylaw, an 1802 bylaw. It said that um, every master and every subordinate lodge or his designee would at each state of communication give a lecture on one of the three degrees of masonry. And in 1833, that bylaw was abolished with no explanation. So I think it's kind of natural as to what you can suspect happened after that. Yeah. Rodrigo, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, uh, actually, um, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Brother Campbell for a great presentation. Um, the comment that I had is uh, actually just expanding a little bit on the, on his answer as well as Worshipful uh, uh, Brother Basak's uh, answer uh, that the the uh, the experience we, we need to give the new mason that initiatic experience make them understand what it is that we are actually doing um spending the time giving them a ceremony that they will never forget to me initiation into freemasonry is a rebirth from leaving uh your previous life and starting a new life but if we just rush through it and uh, just concentrate on just uh, speaking the words without really meaning what we're saying and making them understand, they they will miss the whole thing. Um, you know, my belief is we we need to bring Freemasonry back into the lodge. Um, and the the business aspect that we are so, that most lodges now do in in mainstream Freemasonry, all that can be done ahead of time. Um, the agenda can be sent out ahead of time. Um, the minutes can definitely be done uh, the same way, as well as the, the treasury report. And, uh, uh, you know, just spend just a couple of minutes within the meeting itself uh, addressing that instead of having a major discussion on bills. Uh, in, 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 in the meantime, spend all the, all the time that we need to spend on educating our new Masons, on educating all of us, not just the new Masons, but some masons that have been around for several years that do not understand still what Freemasonry is supposed to be doing. Um, uh, to one of the uh, to to address one of the questions that uh, Brother Campbell had brought up as to whether uh, the appendant bodies uh, are a detriment or a help to to the lodge, um, I, I believe that. You know, if we if we do not spend time educating people in, in the Blue Lodge, that is the the reason why so many Masons try to go to the other uh, bodies to to learn something. Um, and I I did have that experience in my lodge when we were trying to uh, change uh, the way we uh, run our meetings, where I had a senior Mason say, well. If, if you want education, if you want to bring that stuff here, you should just join either the Scottish Rite or the York Rite, uh, because that has no place in the Blue Lodge. And unfortunately, for the last 60 years, that has been the trend. And uh, we have been able to change that in my lodge. We are, uh, um, I love the word Renaissance, because that's how I feel we are doing what we're doing right now in, in Liberty Lodge and in, uh, in uh, in Missouri, and the I think the main reason is because we are focusing on teaching the new Masons, on teaching the current Masons what it is that we are supposed to be doing in the lodge, except you know, instead of just meeting for an hour, an hour and a half, talking about the, the bills and uh, uh, wrapping it up and going home uh, without any uh, developing the fellowship that is necessary, that, that comes from those discussions. Uh, getting to, from those discussions is when we get to understand what every brother, where every brother is coming from, uh, what his values are. Um, so, um, sorry for the, for the lengthy explanation, but I, I truly enjoy the, the presentation. Uh, this is something I've been looking forward to do for a long time. Uh, and um, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.
Thank you, Richard. Well, great comments, Dan. Brian, yes, sir. Thank you. I, thank you for your comments. I, I appreciate that very much. And there, there are two themes that I want to address that, that you mentioned. And the, the first theme, I think, when, when you talk about how special the initiatory experience should be and that it shouldn't be rushed and we should deliver it uh, in, in a, a dignified and, and, um, and proper manner. I, I agree with that, obviously, wholeheartedly. I think there's an underlying theme there, and that is we need to slow this process down. Um, uh, there is absolutely no reason to uh, to think that we have a minimum amount of time to bring a man through the degrees and be raised as a master mason. Uh, we, we would do, I think experience will show us that if we move men through the degrees at a more measured pace, being sure that they have education, not just between the degrees, but some type of an orientation program before they ever take the first degree. I think we'll find that as they are more grounded in Freemasonry, uh, we'll have better retention rates. We um, we had a Grand Master in Kentucky, and I credit uh, Worship Brother Bizak with this piece of research. I think it was Rob Morris in 1859 who criticized the rate of speed at which men were rushed through the degrees and think about this this is 150 years ago more than 150 years ago and he called that process making semi-manufactured masons in semi-manufactured lodges we have a lengthy history of running men through the degrees we don't have much history at all of, of grounding them uh, in kentucky we have three sections to the enterprise degree and if you do all three of those sections it's slightly more than two hours uh, to do an entered apprentice degree. And I can't ever remember a single time having seen an entered apprentice degree with all three sections being done, where at the end of the night, your candidate is utterly, his eyes are glazed over. He has no more ability to comprehend what he just saw than if, if you had kept him blindfolded the entire time. We don't have to do that. There is nothing in our Constitution that says we have to do every section of every degree on the same night. If we slowed that part of the process down, how much better a job could we do of delivering the meaning and intent behind those particular degrees? And there are some lodges in Kentucky that have now done that, and I think they've done it to good effect. So <clears throat> that's my lengthy response to your, your comment. So the first part of my response is slow down. The second uh, thing that I want to address is your comment about the appendant bodies. And uh, um, I, I think it's utterly outrageous for anybody to suggest that explanation of the philosophy, history, and meaning of Freemasonry shouldn't be found in the Blue Lodge, which should be found in the appendant body. But I'm sure that is not an uncommon response. And I would venture to guess that if Blue Lodges were delivering on Freemasonry, if they were teaching, doing their job teaching Freemasonry, there wouldn't be much reason for membership in the appendant bodies. The appendant bodies are something that we've done to ourselves, but they're, we need to be cognizant of the fact they are now a competitor with the Blue Lodge for the time and resources that are shrinking every day. Um, I want to, I want to, Ask Brother Jerry Johnson to comment on something that you said about um, orientation. Um, Brother Jerry, we have an orientation at Lexington Lodge Number One that we started fairly recently. I don't even know if it's been a full year yet, but would you mind just giving a, a comment on how that process works and how we handle it? Sure. Um, so once we have a, a person who's um, interested in petitioning the lodge, we ask that they attend uh, orientation evening, and it consists of um, maybe a handful of uh, potential prospects, along with uh, two, three, or maybe four members of the lodge. And so during that orientation, which takes uh, maybe an hour or two, um, they get a tour of the lodge if they haven't already had one. And as well as we sit down with them, uh, you know, we ask questions to them, what their interest is in Freemasonry, in our lodge in particular, and they can ask questions of us to go over the, you know, the history of Lexington Lodge number one, the culture, uh, the structured degree program, what they can expect um, you know, as they go through the degrees and, and what's expected of them, what type of commitment is needed. 
So, but at the end of the orientation the evening, they've got a pretty good feel uh, as to um, the culture of our lodge, uh, what they'll need to do to progress through the degrees and become a master mason. And we also have a pretty good feel of, of their interest and, and, and level of commitment. Great. Thank you for doing that. You know, brothers, this is a perfect time. If you hear something that someone says, you're curious how it's done, what that means. Uh, this is the perfect atmosphere and environment to ask those questions so we can take knowledge from one brother and share it with another across the country and implement that in our individual lodges. So don't hesitate to ask those questions or raise your virtual hand to continue that discussion. Jerry, thank you for that. Uh, brother Brian, you had momentarily. Uh, was your question answered or would you like to ask your question or give your comment? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh... Outstanding presentation, Worship Brother Dan, uh, Worship Brother Brian. My question was kind of answered, but I kind of wrote down another question kind of to go along with it. Um, thinking about times long before I was ever around or any of us were around, you know, back when Freemasonry launched in the United States, um, I hear the common theme, and I think I may have heard it tonight, that often sometimes we sit in lodge with people we may have never met otherwise. And I believe that could go the same uh, thought process with men from different walks of life. You know, if you think back in the, the old days, uh, maybe a farmer and a doctor and a lawyer and a judge may have been in the same Masonic room at the same time. And had they not been Masons, they may not even know each other. So I often wondered the question of were the meeting conducted and has anyone really spent time looking at the meeting minutes from back in the day, were they conducted in that way to where people who may not have traditionally attended a business meeting actually got some sort of formalized business meeting or thought process, or even the education, the training of having that opportunity that they may not have had otherwise, if that makes sense what I'm asking. That's, yes, it does, and that's a good question, Brian. And if you read uh, some of Chris Hodap's work, uh, Chris Hodap has written about this also, and um, and and he would tell you, and I think there's uh, a lot of truth to that, that the um, in the in the age of um, fraternalism, the golden era of fraternalism, you know, something like you know, one out of every three men, every three and a half men belonged to some type of organization, whether it be Freemasonry or whether it be you know the Odd Fellows or some of the other. Um, organizations that have sort of passed into history at this particular point. But Brother Hodap's point is that all of those institutions were training grounds for civil life. Men learned how to conduct a business meeting. They learned how to make motions. They learned how to take minutes and keep minutes and keep records. So in many ways, uh, the fraternal organizations in the United States were a training ground for civics, public life. So it wouldn't have been uncommon for a person who was a leader in a fraternal organization to then become a leader of a community, a town, uh, perhaps a state. Uh, so I, I think there's a point to be made there that, you know, one of the roles that, uh, that Freemason filled and that other organizations filled is that it was a it was kind of a, a laboratory for civics uh, in, in a particular respect. And, and let me, you know, hasten to say that each lodge has business and that business uh, needs attention. You know, it, it's just that in so many instances, the business of the lodge has become the focus of the lodge. And I think it's possible to keep the focus on Freemasonry and still attend to the business. But that's a good question. I, I, I appreciate that question very much. And if you look at, at Chris Odap's work, I think he's, he's written uh, quite a bit about that. And, and I would agree, Brother Dan. Um, I think you and I did some travel uh, a year or two ago, back when I was still in Kentucky. And I, I believe we said there were several meetings where the, the focus of the meeting was uh, the lodge uh, maintenance or or something that really didn't bring a lot of value to our travel. So I can understand what you're saying on that. Thank you for answering. Sure. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Brother Terry, go ahead. First off, I want to thank y'all for allowing me to participate tonight. 
Uh, I took the liberty of jotting down a couple of notes of some inspiration I got from uh, Brother Dan uh, during his review of the research about that we are the reason why men came to Freemasonry, which triggered a thought that we have the institutional mason. That's Uh, Brother Terry, we lost you. But I found it strange think of people being institutionalized, and that's not always a saying else. This person has been institutionalized. I'm uh, feeling that what has occurred is that we are institutionalizing too many of our uh, brothers uh, and that we don't see it. And that that... Uh, expectations that this is to be a personal relationship, a personal practice of Freemasonry. Uh, Freemasonry gives us the, the, the scheme to do it, but not that individual. And if we don't uh, share with our brothers that you can become a better man at each meeting and the practical applications, I believe the term was just used having a lab of sorts, uh, because that adage, uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that that may be the, the secret. And Brother Dan, I'm going to go ahead and say, I think I might have been one of those guys that sent my responses in and it said, oh, God, I didn't say that out loud, did I? And send it off. Uh, so if I didn't, it was my intention to. Uh, that being said, I just wanted to share that, that that uh, the observing the craft that Andrew Hammer wrote did did a world of good for me personally, and I can share the men that I share Freemasonry with. We do it on a personal basis. We make sure that the education, and we talk about the virtues, we talk about morality. If we don't even have a business meeting, uh, I think that uh, Brother Bizak's point, one of the worst things we might have done was insert follow Robert's rules of orders to have a meeting and that requires zero preparation. You just see what comes next on the agenda as opposed to getting personally prepared. Anyway, I want to thank y'all again, but that was just some, some thoughts that I had about that's working uh, in my close relationships is moving away from institutionalizing each other and making it a personal form of self-improvement and small group. Uh, thank you once again for allowing me to share that thought, but I, I got a page full of notes out of uh, what I got here tonight. I'm excited uh, that I was actually here. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Terry. Dan, you want to respond? Worship Brother Terry, thank you very much. And um, uh, don't worry, I'll be happy to send you another volume of, uh, of Voices of Freemasonry if you want to uh, participate in, in volume six that's coming out. You know, um, to, to your point about institutionalization, I think that's a great point. Uh, several years ago, uh, sometime within the last decade in Kentucky, we had a, a particular lodge that adopted a charitable program, and it was a really, really, really nice program, and it worked well for them. And um, when word got out about um, that particular program, other lodges began to copy it, and then the Grand Lodge got behind it and endorsed it, and it became uh, one of the uh, focal points of uh, of a grand master's program for several years in a row so i don't know if you have district meetings in mississippi or not but we do in kentucky and uh, in the lodges uh assemble you know probably 15 or so lodges per district assemble once a year our grand lodge officers would, would go down the line and say how many of your lot of, of your lodges that are here today participate in this program then to what extent did you participate in the program and it all became about numbers how many uh, how many participated? How much did you donate? So you, you saw the shift in a very good idea for a particular lodge to an institutionalized approach to that same thing. And the spirit of the program evaporated completely. And it's a program that we still do, but it's it, but it is completely reduced to going through the motions now. So at some point in time, I would love to have a conversation with you about what do we do? When there's a great idea like that, how do you keep it from becoming institutionalized? I don't know the answer to that, but I'd, I'd sure love to have that conversation. 
Yeah, good question. Where's Brother Tom? Go ahead, sir. First, Brother Dan, uh, great presentation tonight. And uh, I really want to thank you as Master of William Aware Lodge Research, all that you do for our research lodge. So I want to at least say that. But uh, my question to you is, if apathy and the lack of knowledge of true Freemasonry is the culture, how do we challenge the thought process of those who are entrenched in what they already think is Freemasonry that may not have been what we what we believe? Uh, I'll go back to Eric Marx. Eric Marx uh, uh, gave a response to the question of what would you, what would you say to men uh, who are interested in becoming Freemasons? He said, "I wouldn't say anything. I'd listen." So I think one of the things that incumbent upon us is um, to stop talking and uh, and listen to what these guys say. I mean, if 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 we have a, a conversation with a Mason who believes that the purpose of Freemasonry is to conduct the business of the lodge and plan charitable events, let's let's have that conversation. Why do you believe that? And and you know what do you find fulfilling about that? How do you see that as being fulfillment of Freemasonry's role? What do we come here to do? And how does that uh, how does it correspond with that? I think once we start those conversations, I don't know that we're going to change an awful lot of minds. But what we might do is open some minds to the point where people begin to realize there is more to Freemasonry. And I think one of the things that we do in forums like this is we um, we reinforce each other's commitment. And I think um, our our. Um, determination to um, seek more observant Freemasonry and, uh, and and make ourselves more open and available to having conversations with brothers who wouldn't necessarily be called like-minded, but the, again, aren't hostile to, um, to a more observant approach to Freemasonry. There are some lodges in Northern Kentucky where we live uh, that have begun to incorporate education in all of their meetings. And they're doing exactly what Brother Bizak's talking about. They're making the exploration of Freemasonry the purpose of the meeting. And you can see a renaissance within those lodges. Some men answered uh, one of our earlier questions about what made them hopeful about Freemasonry. And they said they saw renaissance. So once we began to have these conversations, and once we began to look at lodges that are changing the focus of their meeting, then I think it's it makes those conversations easier and it gives us a chance to say, well, you know, why don't you come with me to, you know, so-and-so lodge on a particular night and let's look at what they're doing and let's see how that contrasts with what you're doing at that particular point. And um, yeah, I think that opens the door for us. And um, for all of you who, uh, who may or may not know or may be interested, William O'Ware Lodge of Research meets Wednesday night, November the 30th, and we'll be meeting at uh, the Temple of Phoenix Lodge, 719, in Walton, Kentucky. And I mention that because that will be that will be uh, Worshipful Brother Tom's last meeting as uh, as Master of William O'Ware Lodge of Research. He's been Master since 2019, and we were really hoping he would be Master for life, but uh, but it looks like he's going to step down uh, Wednesday night. So Worshipful Brother Tom, thank you for your years of service as Master of the Lodge of Research. And uh, we're all very proud of you and, and we appreciate the work that you've done. Thank you, Brother Dan, for your, your very kind words. And it's been an honor uh, to be Master of Wimmer Lodge of Research and, and to work with you and uh, under your mentorship. I know I have uh, become a better Mason and uh, excited that the end is near, but uh, <laughs> I think we we've done we've done some some great things, and I look forward to the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brothers. <clears throat> Tom, I hear there may be a, an opening for Rubicon chair. Um, so when you're ready for that, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, brother, where's brother Jerry? Good to see you. Uh, what's on your mind tonight? Well, uh, it's good to see you too, uh, Worshipful Brian, and it was good having you at uh, at, at my lodge uh, recently. And um, you know, I've spoken many times uh, here in this series, which I think is one of the best um, uh, of 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 what it is. And um, 
I've I've spoken a lot about the very things that we're talking about in terms of uh, observant practices and a lot of Masonic education. Um, and and um, I'm I'm part of, of a lodge now that's that's turning it it it, it is a, a, an old uh, traditional lodge and there's that element but we're really building from the bottom up a a um, thirst for and a quenching of uh, uh, that thirst uh, and it's a, it's all built around. Uh, Masonic education, taking our time, being slow about it. Um, it, it at, at South Pasadena Lodge, uh, one has to to um, to attend uh, stated meetings for six months before we'll give you a a um, petition. And during that time, we we have. Uh, pretty frequent orientation stuff, and um, uh, we, we really centered around um, letting the men who approach us um, know what our program is to prepare them for the fact that um, uh, after they get through this six months, once they get into into the line to start receiving the degrees, it's going to be at least one and maybe a two year process we have extensive classes between uh the the degrees and all of this and um uh i i don't i don't want to take up too much time here with it but i i, I will mention that um i i would really love to uh uh be invited again to address this group in in, in the coming year the talk i'm giving now i i call guarding the west gate and it describes this process of really engaging with with men and and uh, making sure over over that six months uh, period before they get a petition that they know what they're getting into if they're if if they're not interested in a lodge that has a lot of this kind of stuff if they want to be made a mason really quickly and and do all the social stuff we'll help you find a lodge that'll that'll that, that that'll accommodate you for that, but 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 we really are requesting a a um, commitment to at least going through that process, and and even the the men who don't become uh, uh, the passers on of that, there, we we have a lot of a lot of emphasis on on um, mentorship. Everybody that does come through that now is at least very. Um, open to things we're we're going to be starting this next year uh beginning having having a 15 minute meditation right after the opening to to condition the environment um we're, we're we now have a, at least a 10 or 15 minute element of masonic education in every every meeting um and uh that that um th one of one of the things that 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 uh, I talk about, particularly in this thing about guarding the West Gate, is um, you know I I've sat in so many lodges where where we're can we're we're voting on candidates, and they know hardly anybody in the lodge, and hardly anybody in the lodge knows them. So one of the one of the one of the 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 signposts for that the, uh, somebody's ready to receive a petition is. They know several people and several people know them. And we are also emphasizing that if you're going to sign a petition, you're making a personal commitment to, to be a mentor to this person. And one of the practices we've instituted in this past year is um, when, the, when the petition is read and more particularly when the petition is about to be voted on, the two people that have signed this petition will 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 stand up and have two or three minutes to say um, what is the basis of their well-founded confidence that um, this this is a, a, a going to be a, a man who's going to be a credit to the lodge and that who's going to be improved by the lodge.
and um, this is this is working really quite well. Um, the men that are approaching us are are very interested in this because we have a, a, a lecture program and and a lot of educational events. Those kind of people are coming to us, and and the lodge is getting that kind of a reputation. So now we wait until we have uh, about a half a dozen or more um, men who have been voted in before we start giving any of them degrees. And then um, they, they, we don't, we start the classes after that group have, have, have all got that. So they end up going through in groups of anywhere from five to eight and, and through the classes and, and um, meditation sessions and things like this, they, they're already bonding with one another. And um, I would like to really, really pitch that, that um, holding your stated meetings in, uh, in the first degree is really essential because um, it, as, as, soon as, as soon as they've got that degree, they get to start coming in and participating and, and, and uh, you know, can't hold office, they can't vote, but they can talk, they can see how masonry works. Um, and uh, it's, it's all of the stuff that we've been talking about tonight. And I really wanna thank you guys too, and especially you, uh, Brother Dan. Um, this, is a, this is a terrific thing that, that, that you, uh, that you have done and 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 this this presentation it's 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 brought out all of, all of these all of these points and and if you if you put them all together it is a compelling program and and if you take your time to sort through who are the people that are really responsive to that and bring them into your lodge and the ones that want to be in a social lodge or charitable lodge uh, and 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 I've 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 taken I've taken people who I don't think really ought to be in our lodge, but I know another lodge that would be a good lodge for them, and taken them and introduced them around in that lodge. Um, and uh, I, I I do I do think that there is a a groundswell for what we've been calling a a, a, a renaissance, and um, they, I I do think that. At the beginning point, though, is that guarding the West Gate, letting, making sure that the people that we're voting in, they know us and we know them, and 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 they want what we're we're offering, and then we deliver it to them, and and, and that's uh, that's a system that that I see working very well and really growing uh, spectacularly at at. Uh, South South Pasadena Lodge. Well, Brother Jerry, I'll thank you for that. And yeah, I think we would probably all agree that there may not be any more important responsibility than guarding the West Gate. So thank you for that. Uh, brothers, we are going to move on to, we're going to take two more raised hands and then we're going to move on. Worship Brother Bizak has a, a question or comment he wanted to make. And then we're going to proceed to close uh, because the, the hour is drawing late. Uh, Brian Thomas, which is interesting for me to say, because that's my first and middle name. Uh, Brian, go <laughs> ahead. Well, th thank you so much for allowing me to uh, uh, join you tonight. It's a great honor. Uh, my Myrtle, my uh, home lodge is Myrtle Lodge in the in, uh, uh, state of Washington, and, and I'm a member of Walter F. Walter F. Meyer Lodge of Research in the state of Washington. I was struck by by uh, some of the discussion that you were, you know, what people will get out of masonry. We had we had a, a meeting very recently, uh, and uh, uh, we we came up with four things that are important that people that have been in masonry for a long time really think that that they gain uh, they are thankful that they joined masonry for. One was diversity. The diversity of the men in Lodge, uh, the social uh, and economic diversity that we have, no other organization will have that kind of diversity where you can meet people on various levels and, and enjoy each other's company. 
The other is the idea of trust and respect. A Mason trusts and respects others. And, and we build on that in, in our lodges that uh, I will trust and respect you. And in turn, you trust and respect me. Another important thing is equilibrium or balance. We don't recognize it in our ritual, but the, the ritual itself is, is trying to tell us to be balanced, uh, uh, equilibrium. Uh, uh, don't, don't, you know, our principles, uh, uh, our virtues all tell us to, to, to seek balance. And the other thing that they've, they've said was, this is the first time I've ever been exposed to philosophy or a deeper things in life than just my vocation and my family. I was struck by those four things. Everybody agrees that brotherhood is important. But when you look at the people that stay, those are the things that, that, that have grabbed them and keep them there. Um, we talk about Masonic education a lot, and, and we think of it as learning the rituals. And, and, you know, we talk so much about how and why and where and when, but we, we never talk about, the, well, we talk about, don't talk about the why. We talk about the, the, the superficial stuff. Why do we do what the heck we do? And our lodge, at every meeting, we break uh go off session for for one hour and we bring the all the chairs uh, together in the circle and we sit there and we have a what we really call education it's not ritual it's talking about masonry or philosophy or even religion uh uh all those things that would deal with with uh, with what makes us good and wholesome human beings. And, and we've been doing that since 2003 and in the state of Washington now, uh, probably a fifth of the lodges do that. And it's, it's very valuable. And I, I really encourage you in your lodge to take a break, maybe half an hour, but, and, and let the conversation roll. Don't have it a lecture. Let it, let it, let everybody participate. And it keeps our lodge together. It keeps a lot of other lodges together and it keeps masonry together. Thank you so much for letting me uh, share something with you and uh, I've enjoyed the session. Thank you, Brother Brian. Uh, well said, great comments. Uh, appreciate your attendance here tonight. Uh, Brother Bruce, go ahead. I wanna thank <clears throat> Ribic. Come. I want to thank William O'Ware Lodge because in the last, what, two, three years that I've been attending, I've learned a lot. We just had our stated meeting for Kill Winning Lodge 356 in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I always thought that, well, my, my Masonic son is going to be the master this coming year. And I've watched him. And I thought that I would be hopefully sitting on his right to whisper in his ear when he missed a word or forgot something. But he texted me and he said, I want you to be the lodge education officer. And at first I thought, hmm, I would much rather be the chaplain. But then we kept discussing it, texting back and forth. And I said, okay, well, if you're going to keep that person is, then he needs to learn the prayers because he's been the chaplain for two years. And I thought about being a LEO and I thought, yeah, that I can help shape our lodge to be a lot better and hopefully start to grow again because we're one that is suffering from decline and I've appreciated so much all that I've learned of things that other lodges are doing here and talking to the brothers here and I have also asked 
Brother Ann Kimball, if I can meet with him since he lives so close, so to speak, right across the river, and give me some ideas and thoughts about how to go about what to do. And tonight's meeting gave me some thoughts for that first because we have in installation in December. So my first time will probably be in January. But uh, I want to thank you all for uh, listening to me and helping inspire me from your words. The one thing that when uh, my dad, when I was starting to join or after I had joined, I asked my dad and I said, why did you become a Mason? Because he was never an active Mason, but he was going to night school when got married to my mom. And my brother was born four years before I was. And I said, no. And he always told me, or what he told me was that Masonry promised that if something happened to him, mom and my brother and I would be taken care of because we would be orphans, so to speak. Now, I don't know if that's true throughout history, but I think if that has some basis, that could be why a lot of men join Masonry. But it's something to fresh thought as to why maybe people joined back then. So thank you all and have a good evening. I appreciate you all. Thank you, Brother Bruce. Uh, Worship Brother Bizak, I think you had a question or comment before we proceed. I do. Thank you. I, I'll, I'll make a comment. Then I have a question for Brother Darrell, who's uh, with us tonight from Texas. Uh, first of all, great work, Dan. A uh, very solid presentation, and I'd like to encourage everybody who has participated or will participate in these in the future, uh, pick out a couple of more Masons that you're familiar with and pass it on to them and try to get more people involved in this process for Dan. Um, and I want to echo Dan's comments, too, to Tom Nitschke. Uh, appreciate your work for the last two years, Tom doing the work of a research lodge and congratulations for a successful past two years. Um, the comment I want to make beyond that is we've, we've talked tonight about how do you do certain things and we have somebody with us tonight who's in a lodge that since the 90s, so I guess it's safe to say for at least 30 years, the St. Albans Lodge in College Station, Texas has been doing exactly what many lodges around the country today are trying to do and making their progress uh, in accordance to their ability to do it. But uh, Brother Darrell has done it. He's a past master of that lodge. And that lodge has um, stood for years as a model to see what they do. Not that they do everything every lodge should do or can do, but it is a model. It's a template to follow. And the one question I have for Daryl is um, the candidates that go through St. Albans. How long does it take them, Daryl? We have uh, a few candidates. We don't. Most of our most of our members are affiliates, mm -hmm. but uh, it usually takes about a year for our uh, our homegrown. Uh, candidates to to uh, go through the, the process um, as as uh, brother Kimball mentioned in, in his discussion we start with a, a little bit of uh, priming before they they take their first degree their mentor is someone that stays with them the whole time he's one of our senior members of the, of the lodge and walks him through all of his work, all of his degrees. And um, we're very fortunate that uh, we have a few guys like this that have the time and will take the time with our candidates. Um, I kind of kind of ramble there. I'm not sure I answered your question, but it, it usually takes about a year for our candidates to go through the process. And we try within a very short period of time to put them to work in the lodge. Uh, it may be it may be roles such as steward 
and uh, you really get your get your feet on the ground uh, in our lodge when you you take on that job. But um, if if that didn't if that wasn't the question or if I missed the point, uh, I'm sorry. I'll I'll try to do better. No, I, I think you answered the question. And, and the main thing is, I wanted to call the attention of everybody else in the room that St. Albans is a great resource. And I would encourage you to call <coughs> the other members down there who served as past master or any of the members, actually, and talk to them about what happened in their lodge. How did they make it become what it is? It's a great story. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Darryl. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Uh, Dan, I want to give you the final word before we, we move on. Anything else that's on the top of your mind to let out for this presentation? Two things very quickly. At, at some point in time, and I think sooner rather than later, the Rubicon Masonic Society is going to be uh, publishing the first volume of its transactions. Included in that transactions is a paper that uh, Brother Jerry Johnston wrote about guarding the West Gate. And we have heard several people tonight talk about the importance of guarding the West Gate. And Jerry's paper is one of the best that I have read in quite a while about that. And it's a completely different and unique perspective. So when the transactions are available, I would encourage each of you to get a copy if for no other reason than to read Brother Jerry's paper. It's an excellent paper. And lastly, I'll close with this. And, then that, and that's very simple. All Freemasons have a voice and we want your voice to be heard. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, Dan. Great job. Uh, brothers, next month, I'm going to have some big shoes to follow up on with this presentation tonight, and I will be giving the final presentation of the year. It will be on December 26th, the day after Christmas. Uh, I will be there, and I expect everyone else to be there, too. <laughs> a couple months ago, Dan gave me a book, and, he, and it was a book, Ethics of Freemasonry by Dudley Wright. And he asked me to read this book and write a book report on it. And um, what I'm going to do is present about that book. And I think and hopefully you'll really enjoy it because it's a small book, but it has a very um, big meaning and purpose behind it. So look forward to presenting that next month. John, do you want to mention and discuss this slide about the Philalethe Society? Uh, I do. Brothers, I won't take up much time, but this is important. Um, you may already have enough information about Philalethes, but we know that not everybody does know about Philalethes Society. It was founded in 1928 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and most of the first six members were prominent and some scholars at that time. Uh, in their earliest days, they were described as an international body of Masonic writers. And it was designed to serve the needs of those in search of deeper insight to the history and the ritual and symbolism of the craft. Now, official uh, membership at that time was limited to 40, and they were drawn from writers and editors of that era. And um, the word Philalethes itself seems to throw a lot of people, and it, it just simply means uh, it's Greek, and the philo is, means lover, and uh, alethes mean, meaning true. So when you put them together, it's a lover of truth. So originally, the society had no publication of its own, but it published its work in other, pub, other Masonic publications. And they tried to get their own magazine started before the Depression and in the years leading up to World War II, but there was a paper rationing at the time. So it wasn't until 1946 that Philalethes uh, and the title they used, the Journal of Masonic Research and Letters, uh, was first published. And it is the oldest in uh, independent Masonic Research Society in America. So we encourage you to consider the Philalethe Society and their quarterly publication uh, as you continue to explore Freemasonry on your own. Uh, a convenient link to that you see on the slide, and it also has been posted as the first post tonight in the chat box if you'd like to lift it and copy and paste it from there. I think you'll find the writing uh, the work they do and the research in the journal of the quality that every well-instructed Mason should be expecting. And if you have questions about it, please feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, brother. That link has been reposted for everyone in the chat box.
As mentioned previously, brothers, the Rubicon Transactions Volume 1 are in final stages of editing. And of course, you will be notified when that is complete for anyone that wishes to purchase the transactions. And for anyone that hasn't already seen the documentary, The Masonic Table, you can go and watch it on Amazon Prime for rent or for purchase. We'd love to hear your feedback on that documentary if you have time. Worship Brother Tom, will you please do the honors of delivering the closing? Hey, President, if you'll join me. Grand architect of the universe, rule of heaven and earth. Now that we are about to separate and return to our respective places of the world, well, Tom, be, be pleased so to influence our hearts and minds that we may, each one of us, practice his great moral duties which are inculcated in Freemasonry and with reverence, with reverence study and obey the laws of which thou hast given us. Amen. So much to be. Thank you, Tom. Amen. Brother and friends, thank you again for joining us. Our next meeting is December 26th, 7 p.m. Eastern. You can RSVP uh, or invite others to RSVP on our website. Uh, of course, you're already on our list, so we will notify you with that information the morning of. Brothers, be safe. Have a great Christmas. Happy holidays. Uh, thankful for each and every one of you, and have a great evening, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.